everybody for joining us. Um, we know there, we know because we know Izar who's presenting right now. We know there's a lot of great talks going on, so we do appreciate you guys um, attending our talk. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, just some quick background: Tanya and I, uh, we're both from Dell, and we've worked together for about seven and a half plus, maybe eight years, um, in the product and application security group. And um, most of our time has been spent together uh, managing vulnerability response. Uh, while most of our experience has been, I would say, very heavily influenced by our experience and in interactions at Dell and previously uh, EMC, um, we've all, we're also both very actively engaged um, with our industry peers and also with the first organization. So I would say that our perspectives really reflect not just, not just Dell-centric, but really, an uh, industry. Just working with different vendors. Oh, you've got to do that. So I really always like to start with a story because it kind of level sets everything in many ways. So this date and time represents actually one of the worst maritime disasters to date. Does anyone know what it is? Titanic? Yes. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> so the interesting thing about Titanic is basically at this ship's time, 400 nautical miles south of Newfoundland, Canada, an iceberg was spotted, and before you know it, Titanic hit it. What's really sad about this event was that in two hours and 40 minutes, something that was classified as unsinkable sunk, right? It was a 46,000 ton vessel that within two hours and 40 minutes ended up going two miles down to the ocean, and with that, 1,500 people perished, right? So as security practitioners, when we look at incidents like that, at least for me and Kristen, we always think there's something that we can take away from these incidents as a way to apply to our own line of work. So with that, when we look at Titanic, there was absolutely a whole bunch of failure points that led for that ship to happen. And one of those, you know, whether it's kind of a dependency chain, could be a domino effect, but what ended up happening was it still happened, right? And there was just... Um, you know, something that they thought was unsinkable did become sinkable. So some call-outs on that, right, was number one, when you, looked, when you thought about the lookout, the lookout didn't have any binoculars. So they couldn't really see the iceberg ahead until it was so close up. The second point that actually changed maritime, some of the rules in maritime was that when the actual ship was sinking, only a third of, well, there was only enough lifeboats for a third of the passengers on board. And that eventually changed. So that was a problem. And the third one is, is nobody thought it was going to happen, right? Nobody thought something that was unsinkable was going to sink. And as a result of it, it was actually quite an ill-prepared response. And in recent years, when they actually brought up the wreckage and looked at the hull and the rivets that were used to fasten it, they actually realized that it was made from sub substandard steel, or the rivets were, which were classified as really, like, it was really brittle. And for me, the reason why this story is very dear to my heart is it was built by Harlan and Wolf, Belfast. I'm from Northern Ireland, if you hadn't detected the accent. And, you know, they were busy. They were building two ships at the time. They were trying to do it quickly at a reasonable cost. And in doing that, had no idea that the quality of these rivets were compromised, and hence the Titanic ended up being vulnerable. So when we look at that whole story, at least for us, there are three kind of critical points that we want to take away from it, right? The first one is that in order to minimize incidents, we really need to know what we're dependent on. Once you know what those dependencies are, then you can maybe look and identify what the risks are. But most important on the third bucket is that you need to be able to have a well-trained team who's prepared and able to respond. And so with that, I kind of hand over to Kristen. Right. So for security vulnerabilities and commercial products, that team with that, that charter is the P-CERT. Um, does everybody in here know what a P-CERT is? Oh, yes, raise yeah. a hand. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, so okay, okay, no, no, it's, it's good okay, that you didn't know. No, no. Um, for those of you who, are, who aren't familiar, apparently it's only one. That's okay. Um, no, there's more. Okay. Um, a PCERT is a product security incident response team, and it's it's really the organization. It's an or, it's a team established within an organization that is tasked with managing the functions um, of handling vulnerability response. Okay, so as Benjamin Franklin once said, uh, "By failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail." And and 
The PCERT is the organization's response to that, to make sure that the organization is prepared for success when it comes to managing the triage, receipt, and internal coordination of vulnerability reports. So what, it real, what does that really boil down to? The PCERT has one primary job, minimize incidents. Okay, that's what we're here for. Um, you know, yeah, okay. I just want to, just for those that don't, so initially what had happened, um, there was an organization called FIRST, which is a form of incident response for security teams. And you know CERC organizations are SOCs, right? So basically they handle your infrastructure. So just to kind of give a little bit of background, so corporate, corporate infrastructure is about protecting what's in your environment. Product and application security is about building secure products that could go to your customer's environment or that could potentially go into your own infrastructure through tools and stuff. And so the reason when first came together, we felt like, there needed to be a differentiation between what CERT is and what we do. Because, you know, we do have incidents in our products, right? You know, you look at routers, all that sort of stuff. If you're not proactively looking after or managing them, then, you know, somebody needs to respond to it. And typically you work with your vendors and your vendors have a responsibility to let you know what's going on as well. So hopefully that kind of gives a little bit more clarity, but if not, well, we'll go into a little bit more. So details. if your organization doesn't have a PCERT, the, the, the folks who actually perform that function is your customer support, okay? Um, so really, inside the organization, if you have a PCERT, the PCERT is the, the primary responsible party for vulnerability response. But vulnerability response does not happen in isolation. We're totally affected by the ecosystem, the climate that we live in and operate in. Do you want to just flip that? So we know the footprint of tech, uh, the footprint of software. It, it is exploding. Um, the advent of 5G, mobile, um, mobile um, commerce, and um, just it's proliferated. IoT devices. We're witnessing some amazing technological growth. Um, with we've got. Um, Virtual reality, our artificial intelligence, um, the infrastructure th that is supporting all of this is exploding. And we know that we work in vulnerability response. It affects us. It's, it's, it is in our everyday life. We know that the way that we build and secure our products has to keep up with this, has to keep pace. Um, we can't keep doing things the old way. Um, with DevOps development, we see organizations with a direct, direct um, investment in developing products quicker, faster, getting them to market. This drive to be competitive is just definitely playing a heavy hand in the usage of third-party component software. Get things out the door fast. Fast, fast, fast. Yep. I love that word. So what does this mean for a PCERT, right? So we can see the landscape, right? It's clear to us. We all see it, right? We, we live it, we breathe it. But what we don't actually see, right, is kind of what's lurking underneath the water, right? That's all you know, we, we just have no insight to that. That's where there's a lack of transparency. And as Kristen pointed out, with the increase, <clears throat> you know, with the, the increase in the different technology stacks that are out there, that's also caused an increase in third-party component. We call it third-party component. You guys call it libraries. But anyway, third-party component usage, which in turn for us has really increased the attack surface, right? So why, right? So three points that I always like to point out, which you guys, I'm sure, are all aware of is, I think Sonatype in 2016 released a report and said that the average application basically contains around 180, or no, not 100, 108 components. That was like two, three years ago. The second point was Sonatype in 2017 came out with the State of Composition report. And in that report, out of 128,000 applications that they studied, I think it was like 45% were over four years old. So imagine all the vulnerabilities. And then for us, um, as downstream, you know, I guess with the PCERT, what typically happens is most of these vulnerabilities are publicly disclosed before we have an, even a time to respond. So imagine, you know, we're Dell, imagine our systems, right? And, you know, these vulnerabilities come out, you know, we have to instantly respond, right? As soon as the fix becomes available, so we keep our customers protected. And when you look at the data breach um, investigation report, I think it was of 2016, they said that most publicly disclosed vulnerabilities, um, I think out of that 50% are typically exploited within zero to 100 days. So for us, that's really scary. So that's why there's a definitely a strong push towards PCERT movements um, in each of the respective product teams. So while devs can happily develop 
and you know you plan for future releases, somebody's keeping an eye on the safety of our customers. Um, and if you don't, it's really customer support. So kind of going on to that, the other bucket of security practices. I mean, do we really know? I mean, maybe we do, right? But not, we don't always have full insights into the practices of our third-party component vendors. Or even not, not, in the, not, not from the PCERT perspective. No. You know, I mean, somebody in the organization should have that insight. Yeah. But a, Before, like, with supply chain and stuff like that. But that doesn't stop, like, a developer going up to Git, GitHub and suddenly just downloading something, right? And then the other one is the unknown. So that kind of goes on, tides on to the last point where if that does happen, you know, for these, um, these components that are not being actively monitored um, or are they, they don't really have a disclosure policy, we don't really know what they're fixing, right? So in many ways, we lose a sense of sight, right? Um, so there's a lot of unknowns that goes with that. So if we take a pause there and just think about this, our landscape is no different, really, from Titanic, is the way we think, right? You know, we're full steam ahead. You know, development processes are getting faster and faster, coupled with technology progression. You know, it's, there's, an increase of, uh, there's an increased risk of something happening, right? And if we don't fully understand those risks, you know, by putting the appropriate controls or processes in place, it can certainly lend itself to a lot of different failure points coming up. But before we talk about that, because you guys are not familiar with the PCERT process, we had a slide in there to talk about exactly what it is. You want to is tap it? it? The, yeah. It? Okay. All right, so just here's a high level look at the vulnerability response process. Um, and as you can see, it, it's, it's pretty much a linear process. It's one thing that I do want to note is VR process picks up where SDL leaves off. Okay, so we're at the tail end. Um, so it, it presents as a linear process, clear start, happy ending with a more secure customer. So just to take you through, you've got vulnerability mm -hmm. report, and, and that's really, that's, you know, we field external reports from third-party researchers, and we do get them on third-party components um, from third-party researchers, which, you know, yeah. they, are, they are submitting reports directly to us. Um, customers are huge, huge. Um, and, of course, just scanning the, scanning the news and the web and just keeping an eye on um, vendor and um, the community for um, vulnerability reports. So initially, you know, we get the report, we sanitize it, we make sure it's complete and, you know, high quality. And then the real work begins. That's really when we triage it to our engineering teams. And see, it's very important here because from the PCERT, you know, we support um, hundreds of products, thousands actually now, we're, now that we're part of Dell. Um, and very diverse product types. So we oversee right. RSA, we oversee Dell, client server networking, as well right. as data protection and storage, right? So we oversee quite a comprehensive right. set so of products. So we get the vulnerability report. We have no idea on the impact across our, our whole product suite. Um, so we go to the engineering teams, and we are so dependent right there on them performing an accurate impact assessment. The quality of their impact assessment directly affects what comes out of that and feeds into the remediation planning. So, you know, by the time we get to remediation planning from a PCERT perspective, we have a confirmed vulnerability. Now we're, we've got to start planning what's, what are the timelines, what versions are we fixing, how are we fixing mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, it's not always just a patch of the component or an update of the component. Believe me, there's components in there that are so, you know, there's a lot of different variations and tweaks that happen during this remediation planning. Um, and then, of course, like once the remediation plan is complete, we move on and PCERT heavy work kind of takes over. Um, we're tracking the remedy. We are um, preparing the communication, the documentation, whatever kind of disclosure we're going to be providing to our customer. And the disclosure piece is the most important product that we deliver because it is what we are arming our customers with. We're giving them the information that they need in order to secure their environment. Okay. Um, so that's... That's the big piece right, right there, more secure customer. They're looking at us. They call us, we, they, we get the vulnerability report, we have to go to the customer. The customer looks at the PCERT, or if you don't have a PCERT, the customer support agent, support group. Um, they're looking at us to give them that security, okay? But we, from where we sit at the end of the SDL, we don't really know if that impact assessment was performed accurately. We have no idea. I think it, yeah, and I think the other point on to that, just to clarify, so, 
you know, if you're just in a web application world where you just, you can apply fixes and stuff, there's not a customer action that needs to be taken, right? Because you're doing it dynamically. Unless you are embedding things in your application where you are reliant on getting notification from your upstream vendors or third party libraries in terms of making it more secure. But for us, we do have products in the field, and so we are reliant on notifying our customers mm -hmm. that there are um, a set of action that they need to take to fully protect themselves. Um, and that is a, a, an industry-wide practice. And if you ever have the opportunity, um, go and look at some of the FTC cases on per disclosure. It's definitely become, like, coordinated disclosure has become quite a big thing. So, um, so just to reiterate, yeah. the, the piece are our goal, more secure customer, need to deliver that advisory. And in order to have a good advisory and to accurately be securing our customer, we're depending on things that are completely outside of our control. OK, so I mean, this is a given, right? So for us, in many respects, you know, we can strive to have a good response, but it's really out of our control. A lot of those decisions are actually made up as part of the SDL process, right? And so the vulnerability re response, as it is, has a lot of interdependencies um, with um, the SDL process that, if it's not managed, could actually lead to failure points within our systems because those decisions are made way before we're even involved, right? And so with that in mind, um, you know, we're kind of going to step through and kind of talk about what some of those failure points are in our process or what we kind of classify lurking underneath the water is what we're coining it as. OK. Um, so but hold we, on. Before I go, who, are you guys just engineers, or are any of you a part of an SDL, like, like a, a, a secure development life cycle? I'm just curious. To do any of you work like in a security office? Like, OK, OK. Engineer, OK, okay this is, is good then. Cool? OK. OK, this is good. OK. So for the PCERT, our iceberg, is right here. It's the vulnerability report. It comes in like we were talking, and you know it, what does it look like? It, it you know it's a customer scan report that has hundreds of CVEs. They want to know impact. It's um, it's a vulnerability report maybe that comes in from a customer because they were on social media and saw all this chatter and they want to know what the impact is across ours. So that's our iceberg. We get this, we are slammed. Um, there's especially, you know, we have very high standards for getting back to our customers. And again, with a giant product suite, um, but yet we have no insight into the impact. So this is where the ship meets the iceberg. And the, for yeah, us it does, yeah. And the clock starts ticking for us because, again, it's all about timely response. The customer, when they submit a report, the only thing they care about is if they are impacted and when are you giving me the fix. So, so then when we look at <clears throat> impact assessment, so when it comes in, we obviously triage it, make sure that we're getting the POC and the information we need to be able to respond. But in the case of third-party libraries, it's typically a version or something like that. And um, when that comes to us, what we end up doing, you know, and actually before I, I say that, it's we, you know, we have t we're on a clock, right? When a third and third-party researchers do find stuff in third-party libraries, and they do report it to us because they happen to find it in our product, and then we have to then go to the third-party component to do, you know, to kind of work with them on disclosures, right? So there is a, a huge interdependency, right? And the clock starts ticking, so it gets, it's hard, number one, you know, in the sense that we just, you know, we're constantly being asked for updates and updates by the researcher, and we manage that, and we're thankful for them, right? And the other one is, is like if there's a highly scrutinized vulnerability, like Meltdown in Spectra or Heartbleed or Bash, all those, like people freak out, and it's like, are I impacted? Am I impacted, right? And so there is a responsibility as, you know, as a company in each of you to be able to provide a response back, right? Um, and so we rely on the engineering teams. Once we get it, we triage it, we hand it over to engineering, and we basically manage that process. So we're dependent on them in providing a response, but we do have quality gates that are set up to make sure that what they give us is complete. However, assumptions are made. For example, when they give us um, an assessment back, when they've conducted it, an assessment back, they, um, like, we don't always know. Like, there's a level of trust, but no verify, right? We trust that they're doing the right thing. Or if um, something came in on, say, a version of maybe, say, OpenSSL, do they go and look at all the different instances? Because, you know, to think that you ship one version 
you know, most organizations don't, they may have multiple versions. And being able to understand that and streamline that to make sure we get a comprehensive response is, is really important. But um, the biggest failure point here for us is um, that actually impacts our ability to respond effectively, really comes down to not having a quality bomb or a bill of materials, right? You know, so, you know, when they provide something back, how can they provide something back? Like, do they have an accurate bomb? What, what are they actually tracking? And who's responsible for maintaining it? And who, who updates it, right? Um, is it 100, you know, do they list 100, hundreds and hundreds of components, or are they just targeting a few? Right? And so for us, like if you have, say, big highly scrutinized vulnerability coming tomorrow, the actual time to respond gets majorly impacted if they don't have something like that that's of a, you know, quality in nature. And so that really does impact our response process. Sure. No, no, you have to go through I, mediation. Uh, yeah, no. We have oh, to go oh to we have one. animation. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> didn't know that. It's very fancy. Yeah. Um, okay, so as we, we, as we saw, um, once, you know, remediation plan, we, it's confirm, confirmed vulnerability. We've got, we've got it, hopefully getting a plan together. Some of the potential failure points, this is really, really where, I don't even want to say it, but this is, this is where it all kind of comes to light with what kind of thinking, planning, um, all the, the decisions that were made long before we were ever involved. This is where it really starts to come to light. So some of the potential um, failure points here is, um, you know, we aren't going to be able to deliver, a, we're not going to be able to deliver a fix, a timely fix, because, well, the upgrade path provided by the supplier or the community isn't compatible with our product. You know, we've added features and functionality since we initially embedded the component, and we haven't updated it in a long time. And, you know, now when we go to update it, things break. So there's going to be, it's going to stretch the timeline. Um, and really, like we were saying, that the clock is so important here because it's, it's the customers. And, you know, there's industry standards and there's expectations on getting that fix out. And, we're, you know, these are public vulnerabilities. So, um, so that, there's one. Um, maybe the component is embedded in such a way in the product that to update it, requires major architectural changes. And we all know that those kind of changes don't happen lightly and they don't happen quickly. Uh, maybe the component supplier, it, you know, is, has no longer supporting. The, and that this we've seen a lot. This, you know, we've had instances where we've had third party researchers come in, and report something on a component that we embed and is like 10 years old and there's nobody that we can even contact in the community. So we end up having to take on the burden. I mean, there's, you know, there's other, reasons why that is such a bad thing that it got this long as well. But now we're responsible. We're going to make that change. We're not going to go to a different component. Now we're, we're taking on that burden of now maintaining um, that component. Um, so again, it's really during this phase where all those, you start to realize how much of these long-term TPC um, implications, were they considered during the planning phase when the product was being designed and built? This is where it all kind of starts to come to light. Yeah. Okay, and so then of course we get to these final two stages. This is really uh, PCERT land, and again, I can't say it enough. This, uh, the, product, uh, the end product we deliver, the security advisory, doing that in a timely fashion, the most important thing we deliver, and the quality of it is 100% uh, dependent on the investigation being thorough, and then the remediation plan obviously is dependent on the investigation in the impact being thorough. And the actual delivering of the remediation plan, actually implementing the fix, is dependent on so many other things, architecture, ease of update, so. Um. And nobody really likes to be living in the land of always constantly reacting, right? Um, I think if we hit that, especially where we're at, I think from, you know, DevOps and all, all the different, you know, progressions that are happening, we need to be a lot more future thinking about how we can be a lot more proactive. And so to go from reactive to proactive, which in effect for us is really going from minimizing potential incidents to kind of managing vulnerabilities, right? And really, um, when you look at PCERTs and, um, or even customer support who have to handle these, you know, the OSS or the COTS tax, whatever we, we want to call it, needs to really be pushed upstream, right, into the development process and awareness needs to be made in terms of what happens downstream. And um, with that, you know, 
in order for that to truly happen, there needs to be some level. Of, I call. I was going to use shift security left, but I'm like, I, I much prefer harmonizing SDL because the left and the right hand really needs to know what's going on, right? And I just think from, you know, when you look at engineering teams, that even needs to be considered, right? Because sometimes development, you know, maybe development are also working on sustaining the product. Sometimes they're separate, and sometimes they don't even communicate with each other, right? Um, so with that in mind, we really need to start harmonizing the left and the right. And I think with that, when we do that, um, I wanted to kind of, you know, point this out that, um, you know, then we can kind of, you know, we can start looking at those failure points for the intent of problem solving them, right? And putting better controls and processes in place. And so what we're going to talk about now is some of the things just, you know, that we, you know, that we kind of, it's just standard best practices for third party components um, in terms of injecting yeah. them. And really into what your, we've tried, yeah, what we've tried to inject in our, uh, our, processes. our processes. So yeah, we'll, okay, the bottom. So, um, I think, is there, okay, oops, did I go too fast? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So right this is a pretty normal, standard looking development life cycle, right? Um, the, you know, I've had a lot of experience working in engineering, so I constantly hear terms changing in terms of the different development mythologies that are being adopted. So the reality is here is if you kind of understand the key principles, you can kind of inject it into your own customized environment or whatever mythology you've adapted. Um, and so what we're going to do is kind of go into each one of these into greater detail, kind of just information sharing some of the best practices that we have learned. And <laughs> yeah. Okay. So right planning. off, you know, at the beginning of the SDL, during the planning phase, you know, there's definitely some opportunities to just, you know, plan better for TPC maintenance and usage. Um, just to start with, training, really. Um, there's not a whole lot of training, we found, um, that is available for developers on just the risks associated with TPC and usage, but not just at onset, not just with the initial top-level TPC, third-party component, um, but all of the dependent libraries that come below it, too. Like, really understanding that vulnerabilities in those libraries that your, your top level is dependent on is bad, too. You need to address those, and you need to, um, you need to pay attention to them. So um, it's really a, through education. We want to bring the awareness of the risks involved, but also not just that it's not a one-time, one-point-in-time activity. Like, TPC usage has to be planned for throughout the entire product life cycle, not just the SDL life cycle. You know, this is going out to market, and this is going to be exposed. So, And I want to say we're not anti, just in case we sign like we're anti third party components, we're not. Um, what we're really saying in the training piece is also pro providing the, the level of training to understand how you choose good ones versus bad ones, right? Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, because there are, right? And we'll go into it. Right. Like, really understanding you know, how to assess them correctly and so forth. So, um, and not many, I, I don't know if any of you guys train on third-party libraries around the whole scope. Um, if not, I think from a PCERT perspective, a lot of us are starting to look at that as a means to drive an, a requirement upstream to help more educate our developers on some of those risks, but also how they can potentially control those risks through the training, right? Mm -hmm. So, And really to help support that, we're advocating in, internally, at least in our company, um, just having an organizational high-level uh, TPC owner, okay, somebody who is tasked with making decisions on how to properly vet a TPC, how to ensure that there is ownership of um, that TPC, that decision from the get-go, from start to sunset. Um, you know, making decisions at the organizational level that is um, in, in terms of like what components are for acceptable use, you know, having a common repository. A lot of companies are going in that direction. Um, we need somebody tasked with that and responsible for it, but also we also want to have an individual who's responsible for putting standards around the bomb. Like how comprehensive is it? What's the scale? How, um, how deep in the dependency trails does it need to go? Um, and to ensure that there's tools in place to help build and support the bomb, but also that there's a mechanism to, become, to use the bomb to get and glean security details from it. Um, so we're, we're talking about an organizational owner, 
for TPCs, but also you, you're going to need a lower level too. Like every product in development needs to have somebody own that process from the beginning, and there needs to be a clear handshake once that product goes to market. Whether it goes to release engineering, there needs to be a responsible party for the entire life cycle. And so, um, you know, because that, that's a problem that we've had, especially when we're dealing and reacting to high profile vulnerabilities. Um, you know, products will release and they're really marginally supported. And we're going back and we're looking for somebody who owns it so we can find out what is the impact. And we spend a lot of time just trying to track down people because there is no clear owner identified. And that's a real significant problem. And that's going to really affect your, the timelines. And it does not result in a happy customer. No, I, no, I agree. Does anyone have any questions so far? OK. Um, you, I sure, no, go ahead. Um, you mentioned the so mm -hmm. you're talking about the fact that you have a third party component in your system that's no longer supported? The issue is, is that it has to be planned for, right? So the thing is, is that we think about things and we design things too late in the game. In fact, when we, and we've seen other, when talking to other vendors, they've encountered this as well, right? So that's one instance. But if you have a bomb and yeah. you're using tools to help support it, you can use, if you can tie into, yeah. if you can tie into other um, tools, you can have ways of getting alerted when these components that you have embedded and you're using are going end of life, or you can track. You can track a lot of things like the activity around um, the community. You can track things that might indicate to you they, you know, they haven't released a patch in five years. That might not be, uh, you know, supported anymore. Um, so, you know, there are there are tools that you can use to integrate. And, and I think a lot of that goes into the design aspect of it, right? Like when you're designing and you're making those choices. Right, which will go into greater detail, like the kind of questions you really need to ask, right? Because you don't want to be at that point. It's too late. Yeah. You know what I mean? And in some cases, it could cause you to have to re-architect the product, or even if you try to upgrade, there may not be an upgrade path. There could be compatibility issues. So I think the key is, is that you know you you have to manage it. You could, I mean, in some cases, you have to manage it. Or, you know, you may have to kind of somehow get into the code because like with some of the Linux systems, some people have tech in it and they just manage it themselves. But then that's an extra burden, right? Then you have to keep that up to date. Um, so I think a lot of it, actually, I have a good quote I wanted to share with you because oh, Thomas, it's Thomas Watson Jr. said, good design is good business. And I think when I think about that, um, the, the number one thing in design for us is kind of the reconnaissance, right? Understanding, you know, you have to scope out your third party components, right? You have to... Figure out, right? That, that's a good segue because you're going right into yeah, design. Yeah. Um, so when, when we look at that, we are looking in many ways at the fact that um, what is that third party component security practices, right? Are they building it in? Are they bolting it on? Are they transparent with how they do security, right. right? But that's why having a TPC owner responsible for doing a lot of that heavyweight lifting and having a repository can help out. And when you take that one step further, like when you start seeing that picture, then it's okay. Well, okay, they look good, but how are they maintaining it, right? Are they actually releasing security fixes, right? So are they releasing security fixes, um, or are they kind of rolling it into the functionality where it's a little obscure, where you don't know what they're fixing? In addition to that, how often are they fixing it? Is it monthly? Is it, is it quarterly? The other thing is, is like the whole disclosure process, right? At the end of the day, with third-party components or libraries, when, when they're fixing things, they need to be open and transparent about what they're fixing. And sometimes by assi signing, actually most, most good third-party component vendors will disclose it through a CVE ID, which helps you understand that they're being responsible, like they're actually responsibly disclosing to the community. If you don't have that insight, I, you know, those are kind of good, good signs, right? And then in addition to that, um, one thing is like the supportability of those products, going back to your point, right? Um, you know, you never want to be on a version too old, right? And we actually seen that with Meltdown and Spectra, that there were some older um, operating systems that weren't actually patching back to the further versions. And so that should be a cue, cue for you, like you need to maybe upgrade, right? Um, because if they're not actively maintaining it, then, you know, it, could, it just takes that one vulnerability to come in and everyone freaks out and you're like, oh my God, what do I do, right? So I'm not too sure if that addresses it. But you really got to be on it. Like, that's the tax that you pay, right? Or that's the tax that we somewhat pay, right, as well? Because we have to manage that. And then um, 
the other thing kind of um, contractual agreements was something that we were talking about. It kind of doesn't necessarily always fit into the third party open source piece. But when you're looking at potentially COTS or commercially owned stuff, you want to also think about um, potentially putting into your contracts time to respond. I'm not too sure if any of you guys are you need like kind of are governed by any regulatory compliance, right? Um, like PCI, DSS. I mean, if they find something in their system, like one of your customers, they have to fix it within a certain time, as well as FedRAMP. And so, for that reason, it's really important to. I mean, your lawyers sh lawyer should know this, but if not, security should really be in that contract, and you should really call out time to fix, right? Um, so that they deliver those fixes within a respective time frame. And then legal, well, legal, it's a given, right? Nobody wants to be shipping any scary license terms. But um, having a pre-approved list certainly helps the process. And that's good, right? But if you want to get a third-party component that's not in the pre-approved list, having a process is even better for that because you want to make it lightweight and easy. And then um, threat modeling is ours next door. <laughs> so he's probably talking about this. I'm not an expert in threat modeling. Maybe it's horrible will help and answer questions, but some things that you want to think about is you can't take a third-party component and keep it over here from your, your product and application. It's a part of your system. And so when you bring it in, you need to look at it with the perspective of how does that change your threat model of your system? Does it increase the attack vector? Does it change <coughs> potentially any entry points, right? I mean, those are um, pretty big things. and. Um, the other one is, is that do those third-party components have other external third-party components or internal that actually has, have additional weaknesses that could potentially impact your system? Another good tail, tail, what's tell it? Tail, tail, tell, tell, tell sign is security documentation, right? Is there any documentation? Like, are they open, again, about their, their policies, as well as kind of documenting the configurations? Um, and then... The, general, the other thing is, is kind of the general design of those third-party components. Are they running as root? Are they running with least privilege? You know, what, what's their privilege, um, privilege levels as well as, um, you know, some of the other, you know, design best principles for security. And um, the architecture, Kristen did talk on it, and it's kind of one dear to my heart because I think sometimes when we build things, we're so excited to build it, we forget about how we're going to maintain it. And so when you look at... You know, when you look at that and you're thinking of taking something in, from an architectural perspective, you have to think about upgrades. You have to think, in future, will I be able to potentially upgrade this based on how you've architected it? Because you don't want to get into a situation where there's some level of backwards compatibility, right? And, um, you know, even going one step smarter, thinking about, is there a way for you to architect it in a way where it's kind of isolated and it could be like um, little Lego pieces that you pull and push in, because I, I always think there's a way to do things like that, but anyway. So with design, um, we can move on to yeah, the development gotta, aspect of it. The pace. I have another quote. I like this one. Okay. Developers are going to like this one. Um, so you're on testing. No, sorry. Tanya loves her quotes. I love my quotes. If you, if you remember things, remember the quotes. Um, so okay. this one is by Robert Martin, and it says, truth can only be found in one place, the code, right? So no matter what people say to you, you have to look at the code, right? And so for this, um, we have the central, um, kind of it's coupled together, central location, um, isolate external components. They're kind of the same thing. But, you know, when you're looking and sourcing for third-party components, it's pretty scary. You can get them from anywhere. You can get them from the approved list, you may end up outsourcing your development work somewhere else, and they may end up putting, in without, you know, putting it into their code without even you knowing. And then code reuse, we know how like, people like to share their code. Could be in that, right? And the other biggest one that's kind of scary is obviously just developers going in and downloading it from GitHub and from different places, right? So, you know, we, we're striving for this. I don't know if we're there, well, whether we'll ever get there, but this is our wish list from a PCERT perspective is, is that we have a central location for all third-party components to live, right? So people are sourcing it from the same place, right? And you can do that if you're a small company at an organizational level, but if you're a big company, you can maybe do it within a product level or a BU level. But ideally, just having one place for people to go, if they want it, they have to follow a process. 
Um, one of the things with that is, in that way, you know that you're getting your components from trusted suppliers, and there's a way to kind of ensure that the authenticity and integrity of the, those components you know, are kind of, I guess, you know, at least they're cryptographically, digitally signed. Like, they're, you know that they're mm -hmm. authentic, right? They're not just somebody just grabbing something. Yep. And then hardening components. Um, you know, there's a lot of functionality that comes in third-party components, and um, you just want to make sure that if you're not using any of the services, that you kind of reduce the attack vector by kind of either removing or disabling those services. So that's a question always to keep on top of your mind. And um, the other one is if you have any exposed services or default passwords that are attached to an exposed services, please, please make sure that you change um, the, basically the, the default password on installation to a unique value. Um, and then likewise, <laughs> and then likewise um, the security documentation is all, I always cannot, like understanding the configuration of the system is, um, is really, really important. So it is. And then obviously Kristen talked about the bomb, but the inventory of the components is really cr cr critical to managing, um, really managing the, the risks, right? Um, so you can really see what's there. And so how you typically do that is, um, or how we, I guess, recommend how you do that is basically by having a consistent strategy for being able to deliver and maintain these um, third-party components within your system, but also being able to kind of have a way to kind of map it back to vulnerability reports that may come out on it. So that goes back to a reliable third-party vendor. If there's no way for you to know what they're fixing, how can you make sure it's secure, right? So um, I feel like that's a really important point. And then the big question is how? Well, we've kind of six years collective experience working with other vendors. Spreadsheets ain't going to work, not effective. If you do it manual, you're done for. And so the kind of mantra here is really it's got to, you know, we have to take a pause and it's got to be automated, right? And so the automation is a big part in the sense that, um, you know, you want to have a way to automatically identify all the open source components in your code base. And, you know, the same thing, being able to, you know, pick up all the vulnerabilities and be able to address it, feed it back for continuous integration. And then, you know, once it goes out into the field or you're rendering it, you have a way to keep up to date on those vulnerabilities, right? And so the, um, the other one thing that I wanted to call out is scanner... You know, there's a number of considerations with scanner-based approach or the scanner-based approach. I, they do generate a lot of false positives. And the second one as well, it does take, it's quite time-consuming, right? And so kind of goes against the faster, quicker tide. But um, no, um, so the other one is just, so there's a lot of tools out there. You see all the vendors there, you know, kind of, oh, you know, look at these tools. Um, the key thing here is, is just making sure that each and every build you're running it so that way you're staying on top of it. And by doing that, maybe you won't have, or you'll find, you, maybe you'll find that things may be going out of support, hopefully before it's too late. Because most vendors, well, third party, that's where it comes back to like some cases they're good at letting you know when they're going to deprecate it or like they're going to sunset it. But that's mm -hmm. where having a third party component custodian. That's where they should say, hey, you know, you got to get a plan here because you know what, this is going to, this is going to go out of support in like maybe, you know, six months or eight months. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Very passionate about this area. Yeah, you are. Any questions? Okay, we're going we're gonna to cruise through testing because we have one minute left. But the most important thing here we want to really get across is just that, you know, you, in, during testing, you've got to be making sure, using automated tools, like Tanya had said, um, make sure you are using the latest, most secure version, but not just in your top-level components, in all of those dependent libraries as well. Um, we don't want, to, we need to get away from just using standard integration testing on TPCs. We need to go a little bit deeper than that. Um, you know, and unfortunately, I don't think that's really a practice that's, I, would, I, don't even, I know it's not widely used. I don't even know if it's lightly being done. Um, but really, we just want to make sure any, any attack surfaces that, um, where there's third-party component usage, those need yeah. to be tested 
they okay. Um, we need test cases to understand the ease of updating and patching when it comes to it. Okay, you know if if this patching and updating is going to cause a major issue, there, that's a problem. Alarms should go off. We want um, to ensure that you've got um, dynamic and static test cases as well as vulnerability scanning. You know you need to cover all of your bases there. And I think okay. then I mean I think when we step through like um, I mean launching is I think. Just it really, when it comes, like yeah, this. I mean, it's just really make make sure that you are communicating with the customers need to know. So you need to communicate whether it's your P-cert, and it sounds like a lot of you don't know, don't have P-certs, customer support. You need to communicate these, these, these updates to customers because they are not going to update if they don't know that they have to or if there's risk there. So it's very important um, if you are releasing something and you are releasing fixes to get that information out there. And I think the supportability plan, I think we, we talked about. Yeah. Um, I think when we go to sustain, I mean, this is kind of common sense. The so one thing I would just call out of here is two, two key points is the PCERT and SDL were really hand in hand mm -hmm. and we need to work together because we get things downstream that we need to feed upstream. And it's a part of the continuous improvement and should always go back into planning. So we're constantly getting better. And threat intelligence, just to really call out is, there's a lot of pre-notifications that your PCERT gets by working with other PCERT organizations. And so we'll just give you an opportunity to basically be able to get more insight and more information. Right. And with, as far as the challenges go, I mean, we, I was hoping we had a little extra time no, I here. I think we do, right? Because, no, I don't. If we do, because Hold on. we would love to hear, you know, We'll put up there what our challenges are, but we've talked about the challenges. Like, you know, we're beating a dead horse. It's, it's, it's listed right out here, but we've talked about all of this. I think um, but two calls out here is embargoes. Do you guys know what embargoes are? Yeah? So embargoes is a huge challenge for us because we do get notified of things and we can't say anything, but we know certain third-party libraries and vendors kind of know what's going on, and so it does impact our, uh, our response, I would mm -hmm. say, is... Well, the, the problem thing. is, so like when when we do find out, we can't really talk a lot, but we need to know information from our engineering teams, um, and we need them to be able to have the information on impact yeah. at their fingertips. And yeah. it's not. So you know, even though these are challenges and top of mind for us, you know, any challenges can be solved, right? You know, right. they can be solved, and I think the key thing for us is that clear expectations really need to be set. And when we look at that, it really depends on all of us. It really starts with us. Mm -hmm. um, and so... And really, it just goes back to what we've been saying all along. It, it has to be a partnership. We need um, development, SDL, and the PCERT all involved in working together. Well, and the only thing I would say, since there's more engineers here, I'm going to use it as my little totem to call out, <laughs> that um, it's important that PCERTs initially started off with the intent of just responding. But... The world that we live in now, we know that breaches and incidents are going to happen. So we've all removed those rose-tinted glasses, right? And so PCERTs now have become very much on the product side as a means to be able to handle and address those things. But I think collectively between um, SDL and the PCERT, we really need to push the cost of ownership upstream into engineering, since you guys are here, versus the PCERT and SDL owning it. Um, and I think by then, maybe the Kool-Aid of drinking third-party components will become a little bit more real. And there's huge side effects. There really is to, to third party components. But if you adopt some of these practices, uh, controls, processes that we've actually um, elected kind of to share with you based on our own experience, we kind of really do believe that some of these challenges can be solved. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, like anything, keep that look back, continuous integration back into the development life cycle will keep us you know, ahead of the game and uh, constantly improving the process. So yeah, that's it. So yeah. with that, yeah. thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. <laughs> you yeah. didn't realize. It was great. Great. <laughs> any any questions, comments? Uh, sorry. Thank you. It sounds like a lot of activities involve engineering. Uh, it sounds like most of it. So why even have a separate team focused on addressing vulnerabilities? Why shouldn't that be engineering? To begin with, would you like engineers maybe dealing with third-party researchers or customers on why you know on you know responding? Two vulnerabilities because most development teams are very much focused on development. development and from a stain sustainability, what the industry has realized is there's a certain skill that's required for dealing with customers. Um, you know, customers have very tight timelines, right? 
as well as researchers. And so to kind of put that burden over to the team so that they handle it, and more, more, more so drive for consistency in our approach, right? Mm -hmm. So when a researcher comes to us and reports something, say on a third party component library, we have to work that relationship as a PCERT. Do we want development working that in engineers? Absolutely not. Do you think that uh, makes vulnerability management just thinking about third party management not developers' problem since it's some other team's problem? I, I think that's a good, it's a good point. But I think the intent here is, is that SDL and engineers need to be tightly coupled together, right? So I'm not too sure how security is kind of um, built in or designed into your organization. But that's where we have vulnerable, in our system, we have vulnerability response champions who are in the engineering team who manage that process. So when things like that come up, we work with them and then they drive, they're, they're a part of the engineering team, but they're a unique champion. Mm -hmm. And then they help drive those processes for us. So that helps us scale. And so Haral, is our, he was our security champion and VR champion has done an incredible job. So, so it's still engineering, but it's just we're taking the burden with the intent of trying to constantly improve that process, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. no, and then it's, just, and it's, then it's, it's you know, all, all, it, all the documentation communication is streamlined, centralized, and it's consistent, and it's put out yeah. by one organization. So we have our champions, but yeah. it all funnels back up. And like with, with certain disclosures, it has to go through PR and legal, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and that has to be centralized. Any and other? I mean, a PSR, just, we're talking specifically about third party components, but I mean, we are like, a lot of our work is focused on actually proprietary code issues. So, you know, and then, as well. Any other questions, comments? You guys mentioned in the ecosystem that there's a hard dependency on the engineers for the assessment. How does PCERT handle false negatives oh, or yeah. de-escalation of priority? Yeah. So prior, prioritization of, so with false positives, we actually okay. try to do quite a bit of documentation on it if, we, if it's relevant. If there's actually a vulnerability, if it, if it's saying something, if it's just not applicable, we don't really get involved in there. But we do get, we do write, um, knowledge. We put that back actually on our champions because we can't manage that completely on our own. Are you in a PCERT? And are you finding that you're getting a lot? Oh, no, you were not. But are you finding that you're getting a lot of reports in that are false positives? No, I was, I was saying false negatives. Oh, false negatives. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we're not effective or we're not effective. No, so, I mean, no, that's why, I mean, we learn, and so we have a complete report. So there's things that they need to do. If they decide to come back and say something, and that, then they need to explain why to us. So, yeah. so that's a part of our quality gate. And that was also through learnings as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.